Welcome everyone to this edition of our BRAG Brazilian Algebraic Geometry Seminar. And today it's a great pleasure to introduce my uh, co-organizer and friend, Marcos Jardim from Unicamp, and he will speak on logarithmic, logarithmic tangent shapes for complete intersection schemes. Por favor, Marcos. Thank you. Thank you everyone for this uh, opportunity to, to, to give this talk and thank, thanks everyone for showing up. This is some joint work I've been uh, doing with uh, Jean Vallée and uh, Daniele Faenzi. Um, it's, we are about to, to, to close the paper. Hopefully it will be on the archive uh, next week or so. Uh, so this is the world premiere of this, um, of this, of this presentation, of this show. And uh, let's see. Of course, any mistakes written in today's talk is, are, are, are on my own and my fault alone, right? So here's the, the idea on how to define these uh, logarithmic tangent sheets. You take an, uh, an algebraically closed field. I work on characteristic zero because I don't know anything about positive, char positive characteristics, so I, I won't take my chances. And then you, you fix a uh, regular sequence, uh, a bunch of uh, polynomials, F1 up to Fk in, uh, in n plus one variables. And saying that uh, this is a regular sequence is the same that the, is the same as saying that the set of common zeros, this uh, V sigma that I'm denoting here, is a complete intersection subscheme of, uh, of Pn. Next, you, you consider the associated Jacobian matrix as a morphism of sheaves, right? So you, you just stack the the gradients uh, take all the first partial derivatives of these, uh, these k polynomials. And then uh, this defines a uh, morphism like this of sheaves. And the logarithmic tangent sheaf associated to the regular sequence sigma will be the kernel of this morphism. And uh, this is a reflexive sheaf of rank n plus one minus k on Pn. Right? So in this, uh, this T sigma is what we call the logarithmic tangent sheaf associated to the regular sequence. Now, uh, what are uh, some motivations for us to consider these sheaves? First, you can uh, build up this uh, diagram here. So, I wanted this little pen here. So you start with, uh, with this uh, sequence here. Oops. You start with this, uh, this sequence here, and then you consider the Euler sequence, which is this, um, this vertical, right? So this Euler sequence, this row here is just multiplication by the, uh, by the coordinates. And uh, it turns out that the, uh, the logarithmic tangent sheaf, it factors through the, the uh, tangent bundle, uh, the tangent bundle twisted by minus one. Um, and here we get some other sheaf that I'm gonna call uh, S uh, sigma as the, you know, containing the co-kernel of this uh, inclusion. So our logarithmic tangent sheaves are always subsheaves of, uh, of the tangent sheaf. And when you take the case k equals one, when you have when the regular sequence consists of a single polynomial, um, then uh, let s this denote this uh, hypersurface, the uh, zeros of f, uh, and then you can complete that diagram in the previous slide to uh, to this thing here, and uh, it turns out that the uh, the logarithmic tangent sheaf in this case. Uh, twisted by minus one coincides with what is usually called the logarithmic tangent sheaf associated with the hypersurface S. So we are, what we are proposing here is a generalization of the usual uh, notion of logarithmic tangent sheaf for hypersurfaces to um, complete intersections of higher co-dimension in Pn. So this is uh, our motivation. 
it has this link with uh, with this distribution. Um, so if you take the same diagram of the previous slides and complete it, you get this um, short exact sequence here. And um, so this short exact sequence is a uh, co-dimension K minus one distribution on PN, right? So it's a, a, a reflexive subsheaf of the tangent uh, sheaf, the tangent bundle of PN, whose uh, co-kernel is torsion free, right? So this N sigma is torsion free because it is a uh, subsheaf of this S sigma here, which is torsion free. Uh, by the choice of the sigma. So uh, every, every logarithmic tangent sheaf is also the tangent sheaf of a distribution in PN. Um, and yet another motivation is this uh, connection with the rational foliation. So in this slide here, it, it goes one way, right? So if we start with this sequence here in the middle, you get the sequence, uh, the exact sequence in the bottom of the diagram, which is the uh, distribution. And it's not clear when you can do the converse. Well, it's at least not clear to me when you can do the converse. Starting from a distribution, when can you uh, say that uh, that distribution comes from a Jacobian map like this? Marcus, one question, please. Yeah. You, you said that N sigma is torsion free. Uh, I think you need K at least two for that, right? Yes, K at least two, you're right. Yeah, so in this slide, things are for K at least two, otherwise it doesn't work. Thanks. Um, so, and then it's not, not clear to me, if you start with the, uh, sequence in the bottom of the diagram, can you lift it and get a sequence? Uh, uh, in other words, can you lift this subsheaf of the tangent sheaf to a subsheaf of the, this trivial sheaf so that when you lift this map, you get the, the Jacobian of something, right? You, you may be able to lift this map, but then this map is not the Jacobian of a bunch of uh, polynomials. You can always do that when you start with a rational foliation, a rational co-dimension one foliation, right? So if you take, uh, if your um, regular sequence consists of two polynomials, F and G, uh, you can form this one form, this twisted one form. Well, P and G are essentially given by the degrees of F and G here so that this is a one form. And you look at this, uh, this sheaf here, which is the kernel of the one form. Now the one form appears here, right? So uh, its image is the ideal sheaf of something, ideal sheaf of some closed uh, subscheme C. Uh, and in this case, uh, you can show that this, uh, this sequence here in the bottom lifts to a subsheaf of this, uh, this trivial sheaf here, this uh, sums of uh, O1. And this map new here that you get this, so you can show that this composition here uh, lifts to, to a map like that. Um, sorry, this, yeah. So this wasn't supposed to be a surjective. That, uh, forget this, uh, this bit here. So this is not surjective. Um, so this composition lifts to a map and then this map is the Jacobian of something. It's the Jacobian precisely of this exact sequence. And so it, this is a more or less straightforward calculation that you, you can show that the one form lifts to a map like that. And then the tangent sheaf of the uh, rational foliation lifts to a, um, uh, lifts to be the, the, the logarithmic tangent sheaf of a, um, regular sequence with two elements, right? So, uh, 
this is also one of the motivations for me to, to study because it seems another way to study these uh, rational foliations, rational co-dimension one foliations. Uh, now, given this uh, motivation, more or less, how these things fit with, uh, with a bunch of other uh, uh, parts of mathematics, uh, algebraic geometry, let me introduce some definitions. I'm going to say that the regular sequence is locally free if the associated uh, logarithmic tangent sheaf is locally free. Uh, sigma is free if the logarithmic tangent sheaf splits as a sum of line bundles. And it's strongly free if it splits as a sum of line bundles for every sequence that induces the same ideal, right? So this uh, I of sigma prime here is uh, the ideal generated by the polynomials in the regular sequence. Uh, because from this definition here, it may not be absolutely uh, clear, but uh, the, the, the kernel of this map does depend on the choice of generate. It, it really does depend on the polynomials. It doesn't depend only on the ideal it generates. Um, this is true if, uh, if all the polynomials have the same degree, then you can show that for whatever generators of the, of the ideal generated by sigma, the, um, the tangent sheaf is always the same. It's always isomorphic. But as soon as you allow different degrees here in, the, in these polynomials, uh, the logarithmic tangent sheaf is really associated to the regular sequence, uh, not to the ideal it generates, right? It's really an invariant of the regular sequence. It's not an invariant of the uh, complete intersection variety, in other words. Uh, so this, uh, this, this distinction here between two and three is something new when you take uh, higher values of k, right? So k, when k is equal to one, of course, two and three are the same thing. Um, but when k is larger than one, then, then you get something different, right? And this is uh, precisely the, the, the first remark that I made there. Um, when k equals one, free and strongly free are the same thing. And uh, it generalizes the notion of a free hypersurface in PN. And there's a huge literature about that that goes back to the lean and, and uh, Saito. And you know, there, there are a lot of uh, papers and a lot of authors have uh, worked on uh, free hypersurfaces, especially hyperplane arrangements, right? And this is a, a huge topic. On the other side of the story, when you take k equals n, the logarithmic tangent sheaf will be a reflexive sheaf of rank one. And every reflexive sheaf of rank one is a line bundle. So it's uh, when k equals n, everything is free in some sense. Um, so it seems the, 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 the interesting bit here is in the middle, right? When you, when you take k between one and n on Pn. But then Harshan conjecture uh, predicts that every locally free sheaf of rank R on Pn with uh, sufficiently small rank splits as a sum of line bundles. So that would imply that locally free uh, regulars, um, that locally free regular sequences of length K in n plus one variables are free whenever the, uh, the length of the regular sequence is large enough compared with the dimension you are working on, right? So there is a, 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 middle, a middle ground there that, you know, probably all these uh, three definitions coincide, right? Because it, it's, it's very hard, as I point out here in my next remark, it's notoriously hard to construct non-split locally free sheaves of rank n minus, of rank smaller than n minus two on Pn. So simply, there are no examples um, of, on P6 and, uh, P, P6 and higher. Uh, so um, it, it seems that the, uh, this middle range for K, all these uh, three notions should coincide somehow. 
And uh, apparently the, the most interesting where you, you, you may have different uh, phenomena going on is precisely when you take K equals two. And this is the, the, the case that we're gonna focus um, in the next uh, few slides. And finally, uh, this, uh, these definitions here, the free and strongly free and locally free are also related to a conjecture by uh, Omega, Calvandrade, Servo, Giraldo and, and uh, Lin Snetto in the theory of holomorphic foliation, precisely because of this link here between the regular sequences of length two and co-dimension one rational foliations. Right, so uh, th there is in, in, in this paper by, uh, I think 2002 or 2000 and something, a paper by Calvin Drade, Servo, uh, Giraldo and Linz Neto, uh, they uh, ask if every, um, if the tangent sheaf of a foliation is al always is splits as a sum of line bundles whenever it's locally free. So that would be the locally free equals free um, case. And uh, it turns out that uh, we give a negative answer to this conjecture towards the, the, the end of the presentation. And uh, what are our uh, working problems? So the, uh, the problems in which we focus on are uh, you know, motivated by, uh, by what is going on in the literature on uh, free hypersurfaces, right? So the free hypersurfaces, there are two types of questions uh, that uh, people make is whether the hypersurface is free and whether the tangent sheaf of the, the logarithmic tangent sheaf of the hypersurface is stable, right? So these are our uh, first questions. And of course, uh, when you have, when stigma is free, it's not stable. So this is again, this one and two are opposite uh, situations, so to speak, uh, extreme situations. So whenever the logarithmic tangent sheaf is stable, then it's not free. And it's free, it's not gonna be uh, stable either. It may be semi-stable if all the summons are equal, uh, but uh, generally when it's free, it's not uh, semi-stable either. Um, and the other working, uh, working problem motivated uh, partially by this uh, question coming from the, the paper by Calvandrade, uh, Servo, Giraldo and Linz Neto, is whether locally free implies free. To what extent that, that it's true? So in other words, uh, whether uh, the logarithmic tangent sheaf splits whenever uh, sigma, whenever it's locally free. And in fact, one can find examples on K equals two, uh, one can find examples of uh, regular sequences of length two that are strongly free with different uh, degrees, right? So the, the, the various polynomials have different degrees. So you have something that is uh, strongly free. You can find examples uh, of regular sequences that are free, but not strongly free. And finally, uh, you can also find examples where uh, when the sigma is, uh, not, uh, is locally free, but not free. And then there are also examples when the uh, logarithmic tangent sheaf is stable, uh, when it's strictly semi-stable, when it's not stable, when it's not uh, split. So all sorts of things can happen um, for these uh, tangent sheets. Pretty much anything can happen. Um, okay. So let me know uh, if there are any, any questions. Now, let me give a quick reminder about stability. So not every, everyone may be familiar with this. So. Uh, let me just recall that a torsion-free sheaf on Pn, or uh, I'm gonna just write for Pn here for simplicity, because in this um, presentation, I only work with Pn. So a torsion-free sheaf is mu semi-stable if every subsheaf of E, such that the quotient is also torsion-free, satisfies this inequality. here. So this, um, uh, this, quotient here is called the slope of, uh, of a torsion-free sheaf. So it's essentially saying that every subsheaf has a smaller slope. 
where we use a strict inequality for stability and uh, the non-strict inequality for semi-stability. So it, it's stable if the slope of a subsheaf is always strictly smaller. It's semi-stable if it's uh, smaller or equal than the slope of the ending sheaf. And uh, below in the statements of my results, strictly semi-stable means semi-stable but not stable, and unstable means not semi-stable. Right, I'm, and I'm gonna om omit this mu here in the, in, in the rest of my, my presentation. Okay, so that was a quick reminder about stability. Um, so the first, the, the first case that I'm gonna give some results is uh, regarding pencil of, pencils of quadrants. So I'm gonna consider regular sequences consisting of two polynomials of degree two. And you can think of that as a pencil of quadrants in Pn, where these uh, parameters lambda one and lambda two, they just uh, are coordinates in P1, right? So for each point in P1, you can combine the two, the two polynomials and you get uh, a different quadric in Pn, right? So you get a family of quadrics parameterized by, uh, by P1. And let me denote Q sigma to be the symmetric matrix associated with this particular quadric. Right? So you can uh, also think of this uh, Q as the Hessian of the polynomial. Right? The Hessian of the polynomial of a polynomial of degree two will be a constant matrix. And this constant matrix is symmetric. And uh, let me introduce this uh, notation here. The uh, R0 is the maximal co-rank of the symmetric matrix over all points in P1. Uh, and this is the same as saying the maximal uh, of the maximal dimension of the singular set of the quadric, right? So the uh, the quadric the indispensable of quadric, right? Uh, a given uh, element in the pencil of quadrics may or may not be singular. And when it when this is singular, you look at the dimension of the the, the singular set. You max that out, so the dimension of the singular set coincides with the, is the same as the co-rank of this uh, Hessian matrix, Q lambda. And you can think of this R0 either way, either as the, 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 the largest, largest co-rank or the largest uh, dimension or, or, or the dimension of the most singular element in the pencil. And then there are these other uh, two definitions that are that are gonna appear in my results. One is we say that sigma is incompressible if uh, none of the partial derivatives vanish. That is to say, um, that is to say that uh, F, all of the variables are present in F1 and F2, right? Because uh, in these polynomials, some of the variables, uh, some of the, these uh, X1 up to Xn variables may not show up in the polynomial. Um, and we are saying that this is uh, a pencil is or a regular sequence is incompressible if all of the variables show in all of the polynomials. Um, I just want to ask that for every element of the pencil, right? Otherwise it's not intrinsic. Um, yes, this is for every element in the pencil, okay? And, and then, um, and, and, and otherwise it's sigma. Uh, sig we, we say that sigma is compressible, right? So if uh, uh, at least one of the variables does not appear in uh, F1 or F2. And in, in, in this case, the, the polynomial will have a global section. Okay. The, these are the, the two notions that show up in our uh, so this is our first main, main result that characterizes when the logarithmic tangent sheaf associated to a pencil of quadrics is uh, stable. So the simplest situation is when the, your pencil of quadrics is, uh, contains two double hyperplanes. So this is just the case when, um, when sigma is something like uh, x zero squared, x1 squared. Uh, 
Um, so, and this is the first case, right? So uh, sigma contains two double hyperplanes and then actually every element will be a, a double hyperplane. And in this case, the logarithmic tangent sheaf is, uh, is free. It's just a sum of, uh, it's just a distribution. The next situation is when sigma contains only one uh, double hyperplane. So uh, in this uh, case here, sigma, This sigma here will be something like uh, x zero square plus something else, some some other polynomial that is not x one square, right? That it's not uh, a square like like that. Uh, and then this guy is stable if and only if it's incompressible, in the sense that uh, g depends on all of the variables. Now. Um, Sigma is uh, compressible. It, if sigma is compressible and contains no double hyperplane, so it, this is the, the complementary of this, uh, this situation here in item two, then uh, T sigma will be unstable, right? So we meaning not semi-stable. Uh, and finally, uh, this gives you uh, the, you know, th this is sort of the general case when sigma is incompressible and contains no double hyperplanes then the stability depends exactly on the comparison between that number R0 and the dimension. So it's simply that you can interpret this as saying, uh, if your uh, pencil only has, uh, if the singularities that, it, that show up in your pencil have small dimension, then uh, the logarithmic tangent sheaf will be stable, right? So the stability has to do with the maximal uh, dimension that appears in your uh, pencil. And on the other hand, it's going to be unstable when your pencil have high dimensional singularities. Right. So remember this R0 is the dimension of the singular set of the most singular element in the pencil. And so when, when this largest possible singularity in the pencil is large, your uh, logarithmic tangent sheaf is unstable may not be free, but it's unstable. So this is the, uh, the first main result about the stability of this um, for pencils of quadrics. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna say anything about the proofs, right? I'm ju just gonna state the, uh, the results today. Um, our second result that I, that, that, that I like as well is that uh, the pencil of quadrics, we are able to give a complete characterization when the pencil of quadrics is, uh, is free. And it turns out that in this situation, when you have uh, pencils, when you are working with uh, pencils of quadrics, uh, then free is equivalent to locally free. And uh, these are all the possible uh, up to changes of variables, right? So these are all the all possible free pencils. This column here, so these are the, the, the two polynomials. This column here say exponents. So this means the following, for instance, this means here that you have, uh, uh, in this first case, you have something like O of Pn um, n minus three copies plus uh, O of minus one, two copies. So that was supposed to be a three here. So that's what these exponents mean, right? So the exponents here say that you have uh, n minus three copies of OPN twisted by zero, and then two copies of OPN twisted by minus one. And that's how you, you understand this, uh, this column here of uh, exponents. This last column here with the n hat is that it's saying that essentially your pencil, which in principle is on Pn, this n here is at least uh, is, uh, one, right? Um, your pencil is essentially a pullback from this P n hat, right? So uh, the, it, it just tells you how many variables, in other words, how many variables are showing up 
in the in the pencil, right? So uh, if if this n is larger than it's larger than three, then all uh, three pencils are compressible, and they are essentially a pullback from p three, uh, p two, or p one. Right. So this this n hat is saying that well, your pencil is actually a pullback from a p n hat, according to this uh, column. So some pencils will be defined in three variables, two variables, or just to, well, not three variables, four variables, three variables, or two variables. Right. So this is the uh, complete classification of, of of the free pencils. And there is a, a very yes. what is homo what is homography? Homography is uh, changes of variables, right? So uh, up to change of variables um, in PN, right? Uh, and this is a, of course, this is a choice of basis for the pencil. You could choose other uh, choices. You, you could have other uh, F1, F2 as basis for the pencil. Um, and then there's actually a very nice story uh, behind the, uh, the, the proof of this theorem is, is because part of the argument involves something called the segre, uh, the segre variance um, for a pencil of quadrants. So the, the segre invariance is some uh, discrete set of invariants from which you essentially you can recover the whole pencil. Um, and this goes back to, to Segre, and then there is a, a theorem, uh, the, the Weistra-Segre Segre, uh, theorem, uh, that gives you a characterization of the regular pencils. The regular pencils are those for which the genetic element of the pencil is non-singular. Um, and uh, in, the, in this paper, we actually give a generalization of this uh, segre weistra theorem for the irregular pencils as well. As well. So we, we define a notion of the Sager invariance for pencils of quadric that are not regular, right? So, so that every element in the pencil is singular, is a singular quadric. Uh, so we, de we define a notion of the Sager invariance for that, and we have to, to work with that in order to, to prove this uh, theorem. But there is a whole story that I decided to leave out of today's uh, presentation. So this is the uh, second result, this is the characterization of, of the pencils. And then you get, uh, you, you get sort of you know, excited, you know, it works for pencils of quadrics, let's try pencils of cubics. And then in pencils of cubics, uh, Daniele actually found this very nice result saying that on P3, there are only two non-normal cubic surfaces, right? So a normal surface is a surface with only uh, point singularities. Um, so up to changes of variables, you can only find two cubic surfaces that are not uh, normal. And they, uh, they, they are these two there, the F and G that I'm uh, writing down. Now, if you use these two guys to make a pencil of cubics, you discover that the Jacobian scheme for the sigma, the Jacobian scheme is the um, the scheme defined by the two by two minors of the Jacobian uh, Jacobian matrix, right? In in this in this case, if you write down the Jacobian matrix, if you write, if you write down the Jacobian matrix, this is going to be a, a you know a matrix with just two lines. And then you look at the uh, two by two minors of this matrix, uh, and you look at the common zeros, right? The, the zero set of these uh, two by two minors. Uh, and this is what I'm calling the uh, Jacobian scheme for uh, this regular sequence. And this Jacobian scheme is uh, pretty ugly, actually. It has four primary components. Uh, these are three lines in this point in the intersection of the, three, of the three lines. This line here actually has a multiplicity five structure. 
schematic structure of multiplicity five, and the intersection is a very, very fat point with multiplicity 20 in the intersection of these uh, three lines. Uh, and it turns out that the, uh, the tangent sheaf, the logarithmic tangent sheaf for this, um, this pencil of cubics is a null correlation bundle, which is a uh, stable rank two bundle. So the uh, null correlation bundle is the, the bundle that you get by you take a section of the cotangent uh, bundle on uh, here we're working on P3, right? So this is a section in H2 of omega two. And then you look at the co-kernel of that. The co-kernel of that is what we call a no correlation bundle. Assuming that this is a non-vanishing section, right? So uh, there are such non-vanishing sections so that the, uh, the co-kernel of, uh, of this section as a morphism from O minus one to, uh, to the cotangent bundle is, is a rank two bundle. And this rank two bundle is a, uh, called a no correlation bundle. And it turns out that the logarithmic tangent sheaf of this guy is precisely uh, a no correlation bundle up to this twist by minus two. And the upshot from here, the conclusion is that uh, there is a rational foliation of degree four uh, co-dimension one rational foliation of degree four, whose tangent sheaf is locally free, but not split. I think in fact is this uh, no correlation bundle up to twist. And that is the negative answer to the Calvandrade, Servo, Giraldo, and Linz Neto question that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. And so, um, things start to get ugly when you, you know, in this, this business of the, of the pencils, things start to get ugly as the, the, um, the degree gets higher. And in fact, you can find, you can, uh, you know, tweak a little bit these, these examples and get examples in any degree larger than three, right? You add an X to the K uh, suitably in this, um, in these two polynomials, and you can show that uh, you you for any k larger or equal than three, you can find a pencil of degree k uh, whose logarithmic tangent sheaf is the no correlation bundle up to twist. Right, so this happens in higher degree as well. Good. Uh, so this is actually my, my last slides with some uh, summary of some other results about complete intersection space curves. Uh, on, uh, so rigorous sequences of length two, there's two polynomials in four variables. And then we take C to be this uh, complete intersection. And I, we, I'm gonna assume here that the degree of F1 is smaller or equal than the degree of F2 and the, uh, the curve is not aligned, right? So essentially demanding degree of C larger than one, just the same as saying that the, the, the curve is not aligned. Then uh, here are some, some other results that we can prove but are not in the preprints that is gonna appear uh, next week or so. Um, specifically about the, these things that in principle are not pencils, uh, first is that uh, if C is a non-singular complete intersection, then uh, the, the sigma, that uh, regular sequence is not strongly free. Uh, so one of the main things in the, in the, one of the first things you can prove when you're studying uh, hypersurfaces, the logarithmic tangent sheaves associated to hypersurfaces is that Whenever you have a smooth hypersurface, the logarithmic tangent sheaf is stable. Uh, so this is, you know, one, these various results are, uh, are uh, partial results along uh, in, in that direction, right? So if C is a smooth curve, it's a non-singular curve, then we know that sigma is not strongly free. 
right? So it is still a far cry from claiming that it's stable, but at least we know that it's uh, that it doesn't split as a sum of line numbers. Uh, when uh, the surface of higher degree is non-singular, then you can prove a, a bit more and say that sigma is not locally free. Um, and when the surface of small degree, so uh, F1 has either degree one or two, so that your curve is either a, a plane curve or a quadric curve, uh, then again, we have uh, the free, if and only if locally free business, right? And this is regardless of the degree of F2. So that this example of the pencils of cubics, when you have degree of F1 and F2 both equals to three, is sort of the first situation in which this uh, uh, such an example of uh, uh, a logarithmic tangent sheaf that is locally free but not free can happen. And so this is sort of minimal situation where this uh, can happen. That's essentially the content of this uh, second claim. Here. Um, or sorry, of this uh, third third claim here. And finally, um, if now you have you are in a situation of a pencil, right? So uh, the degree of F one and F two are equal, and every element of the pencil is normal. So we have only uh, have at, at most. Uh, point singularities, then uh, we can show that the logarithmic tangent sheaf is stable, right? So in, in this situation here, you have to assume that degree of F1 and degree of F2 are equal, right? So this is kind of a, a, re, a reminder of, of the sort of uh, well-known result that when you have a, um, a smooth hypersurface, the associated logarithmic tangent sheaf is stable. And finally, uh, I end with some open questions that uh, we plan to, to address in our, um, you know, continuing this line of research is uh, really, can we show that if uh, C is not singular, then uh, the sigma, the, the, it's, uh, the regular sequence is not uh, free or locally free, and also, if uh, C is not singular, can you show that the T, the T sigma is stable? Right? So these are some of the questions that are on our uh, horizon, at least regarding space curves. Um, so that's all I had for uh, today. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Marcos, for this very nice talk. Uh, are there questions or comments for Marcos? I have one question about the definition of uh, T sigma right at the beginning. And you explained that for K equal to is this is just the tangent sheaf of uh, a foliation, right? I have the impression that uh, this is true also for arbitrary K. And the, the foliation is just this rational foliations of codimension Q as studied in a paper by Israel and Fernando Kuckerman, for instance. Okay. Yeah, so maybe I should uh, take a look at this paper and this, this, the definition of these other you know, yeah, high codimensional yeah. rational foliations. If you want to de define in terms of differential forms, you just take the wedge product of all your polynomials, take the interior product with R, and this defines a, a one for a, a Q form, a K minus one form. And you can look, uh, you can take a contraction from TPN to omega K minus two and look at okay. the kernel. I think that this is the T, t, t sigma plus mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks, uh, Jorge. I'm gonna take a look into that. Because at the beginning you were asking about uh, uh, liftings, I, 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 if it exists, it's unique, right? Um, yes, I think so. Right. 
Yeah, so it's it's really you are really looking at these foliations, I guess. Mm -hmm. Which well, it, it, it's not immediately clear that if it lifts, it's unique. It depends. In, in this case, uh, the lift is unique because you get a, uh, you know, some cohomologies here are isomorphic. Um, but in principle, the, you know, the given cohomologies may not be isomorphic. And, uh, you know, in, in general, the lift may not be unique, even if it exists. I see. But it, it, it may turn out that in this particular situation, it, it does. If you consider this omega to be this rational, um, this uh, no, rational I, I, Q form. Yeah, but I think that I'm not thinking on the lift I did. I, I think, I guess I'm thinking on, on this descent. Mm -hmm. If I have, a, I, I, this define uniquely a foliation, right? This comes with embedding. There is no choice for embedding T omega from the from your regular sequence, everything is determined. There is no choice to determine the embedding of T omega in TPN, right? No, yes, th there's no choice. Yes. Yeah. So in, in, in this way here, uh, you know, if we start with the middle and go uh, down here, then there is no choice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I yeah, I, I would say that these are. Okay, thanks for the tip. More questions? Probably also this question about uh, freeness that you pose that at the end when C is smooth, uh, it's again uh, related to uh, top chain class computation of uh, the chief of logarithmic differentials with poles on F and G. And uh, this is, was studied uh, by Israel, Marcio, and also there is a work of Paulo Alufi on that. And uh, okay. the easiest way to show that something is not locally free, at least in this context, is to produce isolated singularities. And in some yeah. situations, there is, uh, they come up uh, from this kind of consideration, I guess. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, Marcos. Yes. Wait. Uh, Wait. Let me ask you: Have you uh, have you looked at uh, the connection between the stability of the bundle you considered in the case of pencils of uh, quadrics with the stabilities of, of the pencil themselves? No. Uh, actually, I, did, I didn't know about. Oh, you mean some sort of GIT stability for the pencils? Yes, it's something that uh, Dana Vritzer studied. Okay. Th that. Uh, Mm, you mentioned the, the SEG invariant, so it has to do, I mean, it's, it's given in terms of the SEG invariance. I, I, I don't remember now, but it's something that he worked on and uh, it would be nice to have uh, to see if there's a connection. Okay, yeah, that's actually a very nice tip as well. Yeah. I'm gonna mm -hmm. look for this uh, paper by Dan. Yeah. And have you considered also a net of quadrates or a set of pencils? Uh, no, we, we haven't considered it yet. I know mm -hmm. Daniele has made some computational experiments. Okay. Uh, but we haven't written anything down about it. Yeah, I think Dan worked on nets of quadrics as well, but uh, I'm not so sure now. Mm -hmm. So there might be something there as well. Okay. And is there any interpretation for when, when you have something that it's say unstable, um, so if you look at the, mo the, the maximal destabilizing subsheaf, what information does it give you about the regular sequence? Yeah, so the, the maximal destabilizing subsheaf is actually a kozu sheaf for uh, the singular, the union of all the singular loci, right? So the union of all the singular, uh, the singular loci of all the members in the, in the quadric, um, at least when the when the pencil is regular. Okay, so say the pencil is regular, there will be finitely many elements in the pencil that are singular, and then you take the union of all these uh, singular sets. This, this this gives you a scheme on the um, this gives you a scheme on PN, and then you have to look at some uh, some Kozu 
uh, resolution and some sheath that appears as a syzygy in this resolution, in the Kozu resolution of this scheme. And this Kozu sheath is the maximal destabilizing sheath. Right? So th there is this geometric interpretation as well. Thank you, Marcos. Thanks. Are there more questions or comments for Marcos? So let's uh, thank uh, Marcos again for this very nice uh, world premiere. Thank <laughs> you.